Thanks for tuning in. My name is Ashley DeLeon. Today, we're here with Rajni Eddins, a spoken word poet, teacher, and friend here from Vermont. <laughs> Rajni, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Um, I gave you a very brief introduction because I want our viewers to hear from you. So who is Rajni Eddins? <laughs> oh, thank you, Ashley, for hosting me. It's such an honor to be here. Um, Rajni Eddins, I am a poet, performance artist, educator, facilitator. I use my art <laughs> mainly to confront white supremacy and affirm mutual humanity, um, as, as well as um, empower youth and community to find mutual value in our stories. So I, I've, I've always loved poetry and self-expression from a very young age. So I'm, I'm pleased to be here with you and share some of the things that we're up to, as well as to be in this community and involved in uh, positive, influential ways that uh, is showing promise here. And when did you realize that you wanted to do poetry full time? Uh, well, I've always loved poetry, as I said, from my mother encouraging me to share some of my own pieces. Even before then, she used to regularly have me read her pieces back to her with feeling, she would always say, uh, because it was very important to bring a certain musicality and energy and uh, take the reader or the listener there to where you were creating from when you first drew from that piece. So just seeing such beauty and brilliance created and reflected in my community and also being much loved on and supported and affirmed in my own gifts and my craft, I think I saw promise early on in, in wanting to do that art full time. But it was only maybe about three years ago, maybe just a year before the pandemic, when I was able to transition full-time into self-employment as an artist and poet. What was the hardest poem that you've ever written? The hardest poem that I've ever written? Um, hard as in difficult to write or hard as in content or? Emotionally. I think that'd probably be for Trayvon Mike Brown and the Countless Unnamed. That's a poem that was actively shared and has been since the time of the uprisings in the year of the pandemic, um, where Black Lives Matter and the need to confront white supremacy became more uh, viscerally, uh, collectively aware um, throughout this region and the world. And I had written that poem actually in 2016, I believe, during the trial of George Zimmerman, who had killed uh, Trayvon Martin in cold blood. Um, I had been in conversation with a, another friend and poet of mine back home in Washington, Chelsea Richardson. Uh, shout out to Chelsea. And uh, we were wanting to write something around all of these killings and murders of black people that were going on and continue to go on with um, impunity. Uh, and so we wanted to bring something to the collective consciousness that could inspire, encourage, and empower people to have a deeper sense of mutual humanity and to really sensitize them to the experiences of black people historically and present day that could help transform community and society. So she had called me and let me know that the um, verdict had been released and that Zimmerman was actually absolved of any responsibility um, due to a law called Stand Your Ground, which gives credence to allow for people to claim that they were feeling fear and that when they do harm to others, they're acting out of self-defense, even if they weren't aggressed against. So it's another way of kind of safeguarding um, the rights of people who aggress against black people, which is very historical in this country. So when I learned that that verdict had come, I tried to reassure my friend Chelsea, you know, this probably happened for a reason. This is why exactly why it's so important that we create these pieces so we can touch people's hearts and minds in dynamic ways and shift the culture and climate of the times that we're living in especially in our own communities. And I, I felt like I was trying to reassure myself as well as her. And I got up the phone and I just wept myself. And that, that poem kind of came whole cloth that night. And then I, I became more actively sharing it whenever there was another person killed. And so I would be always coming to the rally to hold space for people to say the names of the many people who were murdered. Um, but then of course, over the course of the pandemic, there were uh, an aftermath of the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. There were so many rallies and protests and uprisings that it became kind of a, a spiritual theme and ritual in terms of 
coming to hold the greater community accountable, to say the names and to honor the people that these were human beings, not just hashtags, and to think more deeply about what we can do to transform our own consciousness and to create um, a deeper sense of um, accountability to the type of human relationship we want to have and bring children into. So just to kind of shift the conversation a little bit, you do a lot for the BIPOC community here in Vermont, in particular, what, particularly empowering youth. Why? Well, uh, I think I've always had a great love for children, being a child <laughs> once myself. Also, I saw in my own household just the power of love and devotion and positive affirmation, all uh, those things that can really inspire, encourage, and uplift and help to self-actualize children. So that's something I've always been passionate about. My mother, in addition to being the founder of the African American Writers Alliance, Randy Eddins uh, was also a foster parent to over 70 children. So I had a great deal of uh, brothers and sisters growing up and I saw the power of love even in short um, time spans that the, having that those properties to be able to heal and restore and to um, allow people who have wounds and traumas you might not even know about to feel comfortable in themselves and to at least have the opportunity to have the semblance of family in the time span that you have with them. So I think that's why I still do it to this day, having seen my mom in, her, in action and how much of her life she devoted to that necessity for cultivating community and care for children as an ethic and as a, a standard and a way of being. Um, she definitely imbued me with that same spirit. So my love for children is the same. She always says, children are treasure. So I take that to mean children are treasure. And by that note, all people are, because we all begin as children. And if ever you find a dynamic or a relationship where people are not uh, exhibiting that type of appreciation, you have to know they're coming from a place where they don't necessarily recognize that about others or themselves. So why Vermont youth specifically? Uh, well, Vermont is where I'm based. I, I've been here for 12 years. I have a daughter here. I have a vested interest in the community that I live in and seeing that I have um, the opportunity to make use of my gifts in ways that support community, in ways that support the youth. I don't think of other people's children as other people's children. I think of all children as our children, so there are shared responsibility. Uh, it takes a village is more than just a pithy statement. Um, to me, it's something that's to be personally practiced, and the more we give credence to that in sincere ways, the better off all of our children will be. That's great. So what does your day-to-day -day life look like now? Ah, well, my day-to-day -day life now, since I've transitioned to full-time employment as an artist, living that dream, it's possible, guys. <laughs> um, it, it looks like upkeep of, uh, of, of business opportunities as far as engagements to, to share in community in different capacity, whether it's performance oriented or a speaking engagement that speaks to the link between artistry and activism, or writing workshops for youth and students, or DEIJ work, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice work for educators and people of different institutions and organizations. I've been able to find kind of a niche for myself in seeing a multiplicity of practical utilities for my art form. And since it primarily has to do with the spiritual component of shared human story, it has so many ways to um, offer human beings something valuable. That's wonderful. Do you see yourself doing this 10 years from now? Yeah, 10 years from now, I see myself doing this on a much grander scale. And also, <laughs> my daughters and other youth um, in my tutelage and in my circle being emissaries of their own artistic and creative practices that can inform and inspire the world in ways we're not even privy to now. I just want to be an effective uh, vessel and um, descendant of the ancestors we come from. My daughter has a poem called Your Blooming Tree, where she speaks about uh, the ancestors in this tree and then talks about the people to come who are part of the same brilliant blackness of who will come. So I see, our, I see myself and I see us as part of a continuum uh, that is perpetual, 
that we're drawing from the strength and experiences and the trials and triumphs of our ancestors in order to be good ancestors for those who are here and next to come. How does she inspire your writing? Uh, just by being her brilliant, naturally unique self. You know, she's got such a powerfully potent imagination and creativity and a hilarious sense of humor and very thought-provoking ideas about the world and her place in it. So I think just by witnessing her and her own organic unfolding, it's constantly inspiring me in, in untold ways in my writing and just in my life and by learning to be a, a better human being. Do you remember the first time you've ever helped her write a poem? Oh my goodness, we've written so much poetry. Um, but I think most recently we wrote a poem actually for her grandmother and that was that was beautiful. She was the one actually who uh, initiated that. She said, we should write a poem for, for Nadi's birthday. So we were able to create a piece together. Every time we create together, it's such a glorious undertaking. I can remember when she was um, a toddler and I would always ask her, so what's the story about? And she says, it's, it's about a bear and a unicorn and a monkey. And I just, she just have a litany of creatures <laughs> to add to the story. And I'd say, uh, okay, once upon a, she's like, no, let me tell the story. I'm like, all right, you go ahead. So like, once upon a time, and then she'd share her piece. And then we would begin that. And then what happened process. And I think that's very important for children, you know, just to hold space for um, playfulness with imagination. So I have, yeah, I have so many different fond memories of us creating together. That's wonderful. And you mentioned earlier in one of our conversations that your daughter often performs the friend of hers. So how do you think that relationship, how do you think that relationship really impacts the storytelling and the empowerment between the two of them? Well, I think young people have a lot more on the ball and a lot more in terms of their opinions and ideas and perceptions um, than we perhaps give them credit for. I think that particularly with Amina and her friend Andrea, they have found a bit of an oasis in being able to bounce ideas off of each other as peers and as they discover different histories and stories in the world that they are trying to make sense of and use their art and their expression to grapple with. Um, it's giving them so much freedom, you know, and, and positive affirmation and, and realization of their power and the, the force of nature that their voices are and, and can be as they grow. So I think that that's something that I'm, I'm definitely witnessing and, and proud to see and quite frankly awestruck by. And I think that the more youth have those opportunities to express themselves in profound ways, the more um, adults take an uh, a opportunity to give their egos a back seat and actually hold space to listen to youth and to hold space for their critical thinking and what ideas they're bringing forth. Um, so much beauty and brilliance and um, so many valuable lessons can come from that. It's wonderful. So shifting back to you as a poet, you have a new book. I do, I do. Tell us all about it. Well, this is my new text. It's actually called In the Coded Language of This Mortal Tongue. This is the follow-up to my work um, that came out in 2019, Their Names Are Mine. And as you can see, it has pictures of my mother, um, my little brother DJ, my aunt and Nancy and Uncle Chuck and cousin Karen, my mother again. My mother's all over this. This is a much more personal text uh, per se than their names are mine. It speaks a lot to the microaggressions and just racial aggressions in general I've experienced living here in Vermont. And I think people will find in the text um, perhaps some mirrored reflection of their own experiences and also some teachable moments to have a deeper understanding and compassion of what people of African descent and people of the global majority go through in homogenous areas like Vermont. So I really want it to be an extension of their names are mine and to be utilized as a teaching tool and also just a humble offering of my own personal experience, some of the trials I've gone through 
and also speak to the testimony of how we've persevered through them and now use that art to kind of alchemize um, the challenges of those experiences into teaching tools and into ways uh, we can access self-healing. That's wonderful. Would you be able to read a passage from your book? I would love to. Um, maybe I can read uh, a passage from, would you like a whole poem or just a selection? Whatever you prefer. Surprise us. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe I'll, I'll do one of the, the opening pieces that's become quite um, fondly appreciated by a local community. We actually shared this piece on the uh, the grand stage too, over at um, the Flynn Theater, because we just had the first ever Black Unity Summit in the history of Vermont, or New England, and we brought Dr. Angela Davis. And so we opened with this poem to kind of honor the coming together of Black people across the diaspora and the valuable import that that represents for us and for all people. So this is called Beautiful Sun-Kissed People. Beautiful sun-kissed people, walking miracles, unfolding parables, ancient scrolls and ocean's throes, love be a rose adorning your ears. This morning will not bring mourning nor a thorn in tears. This forever moment is shorn of fears. Beautiful sun-kissed people, we are on the cusp of overthrowing overseers. Light years beyond heckles and jeers. No more tanning our hides where Dr. Jekyll steers. This love is sheer, transparent and near, as dear as your closest relative here. Beautiful sun-kissed people, no conversation on us being equal, just entertaining the thought is evil. We weave full, fully woven, lost and found, traded and stolen, but look what the eye beholding. Beautiful sun-kissed people, golden, black and free and ebony, mahogany and mocha bee, chocolate hagen dyes can't see, rivers running melanin, Shallow men be monitoring, but most high got it all intents and purposes and sovereign skin. Watch as this here poem ascends, journeying and frolicking. Summer breeze is talking with the autumn wind, how winter just won't break our stride. Too much spring and step for us to hide. Our victory is justified. Beautiful sun-kissed people, solarized with older ties, our currency ain't tokenized. We close to those focused and wise whose feet arise on open skies. We white supremacy eulogizing, Blessed ministry, new horizon, and desperate attempts at euphemizing our brilliance and futile lies still will never neutralize. Too many youth been euthanized, fed sweet as prey to tooth decay, but truthfully our rootful way has truth to say, adorns the night, salutes the day, in beauty that the stars obey. Beautiful sun-kissed people, I relate to you so musically, and oh, the joy it brings, like, lift every voice and sing, Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Let earth and heaven ring in sacred oath, cause after all we are betrothed to wondrous wonders of untold, great grand good fortune that broke the mold. Can't buy us off with moldy bread. We've more than crumbs inside our heads and crust just will not satisfy when banquets alone are ours divine. We walk in gourmet grandma made, deliciousness in every shade. Sun-kissed people, beautiful, blessed, bountiful, sun-kissed people, I praise a path that plants our flag squarely in earth, a self-made baskin, a glorious newfound approach that predators cannot encroach, that parasites and wayward folks out of mere glimpse will cough and choke. See, this radiance is brighter still than every sun that lights a hill. It calls from something deep within and pours from vocal cords and pen. Beautiful sun-kissed people, I'm nourished just to see you. You furnish my living room with life-abundant killing gloom. 
You water every plant I have and flourish my gardens green and vast. Sing lullabies to my inner child and soothe all fears of foul defile. You spray me with your sense of grace and lovingly embrace my face. Say I am you and we are a race that founded every human trace. Sun-kissed people, I wake with your poems on my tongue. In my chest I hear your drum, from my lips I hear your hum. It gets me high and drunk as rum. On you I am forever spun, your melanin I'll never shun. With you I am forever one, has there been better never one. Sun-kissed people, I bequeath these odes to you, your next of kin and children too, and their children's 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 view will yet still match your vibrant hue. You supernatural sorcery, to walk in temples gorgeously, shaming cathedrals far and near, make a white Christ pale in the mirror. Sun-kissed children, you are it. Don't let nobody tell you shh, unless they fertilize in soil, to grow a rose regal and royal, to don a rose upon a rose of red and black and green and gold, so poetically bestowed it dignifies your inner throne. Sun-kissed children, marvelous, miraculous magnificence, outlandishly so unabashed, unapologetic sass, ultra-magnetic blackness, the right goddess on your epitaph. That's blasphemy, surely, right? Because we know true gods never die. Sun-kissed children, you kiss my eyes with all that sunshine you applying. I say I am in love for true, because you are me and I am you. From head to toe and all between, I love these princes, kings, and queens. I even find you in my dreams, and when I wake, I vow to breathe and breathe to vow. With every vowel and consonant I can pronounce, announce to cosmos all your feats. Build castles for your sweet retreats, goose-feathered pillows, black satin sheets, a sacred lounge to rest your crown from all the wounds been crying out. Sun-kissed people have no doubt. You're all I am, what I'm about. Can't tell my story without your page. Every chapter be erased. You sew my lines so seamlessly. We vibe on higher frequency. So let's not love in secrecy. My son kiss people, we be is the key. Thank you so much, Rajdi. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you. My honor to share. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us today? Um, well, yes, I'd like to make known to the community that we're actually launching the Patreon for the Black Artist Showcase that we do monthly. Um, ordinarily, we have it on first Fridays and final Fridays at Soda Plant and at Crew Coffee. But we're going to be launching a Patreon in order to be able to travel more widely as a collective throughout the Burlington School District and throughout the greater state of Vermont and New England, using our art as a way of positive affirmation, um, of expansion, of horizon and narrative in spaces that can be very uh, Eurocentrically focused uh, and allowing for a deeper insight to shared human story. So we will actually be launching the Patreon officially um, and having several events surrounding it at the Art Hop at Soda Plant on the 10th through the 12th. So definitely look for more information uh, for that in the coming month or so at www.rajneedins.com. That's R-A-J-N-I-I-E-D-D-I-N-S.com. As well as feel free to reach out to me at their names are mine at gmail.com if you want more information. All right. Thank you again so much, Rajni, for joining us. And thank you for tuning in. Like Rajni said, if you're looking to learn more about Black Artist Showcases or to learn more about his work, visit RajniEdins.com or email their names are mine at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you so much.